Good afternoon, class. Uh, today we're going to talk about Chapter 9. <clears throat> chapter 9 discuss uh, behavioral finance and technical analysis. Uh, one of these, uh, they're, they're linked in some ways, um, but I find that, in my view, behavioral analysis actually leads technical analysis and not the other way around. Uh, hopefully those comments might, might make a little bit more sense after I go through a few of these slides for you. So just flip it open those slides. Um, chapter nine, uh, behavioral finance and technical analysis. Uh, behavioral finance, uh, financial uh, market model emphasizing potential implication of psychological factors and in affecting investor behavior. And this is around the existence of irrational investors is not sufficient to render capital markets inefficient. So uh, there's an aspect of human psychology uh, that has an impact on stock prices. And, and what that impact is, is a little immeasurable. But if you think about how behavioral finance uh, impacts a particular stock, uh, a company typically at a minimum will release information four times a year during their earnings periods. And then the movements of that stock in between its earning periods, in between getting information, um, could be considered some of the impact of behavioral finance. Um, so there's a little bit of a pro and a con with behavioral finance. Some of this is information processing. You know, when you talk, talk about how do errors uh, in investing occur due to behaviors, information processing. You know, do you know the best stock or do you know the best stock out of 10, right? You know, we can only absorb so much information. So people overvalue recent experience compared to prior belief when forecasting. So we tend to have a recency bias. Next, overconfidence. People overestimate the precision of beliefs or forecasts and overestimate their abilities. This is a very common, you know, overconfidence bias is huge. Just because you got the last one right, what are the odds that you get the next one right? Um, this also leads to another common bias, uh, which is the hot hand fallacy, meaning if you got three in a row, are the odds better that you get four in a row? Uh, it depends, but generally no. Uh, conservatism bias. Investors are too slow in updating their beliefs in response to recent evidence. Conservative and bias uh, really provides an anchor on the investor. They, they don't update new information and they hold old information uh, stronger. Good example of this would be looking at uh, telling someone about uh, an investment in the New York Times. They might be like, a newspaper? Why would I invest in a newspaper? And then you try to tell them that the New York Times is now a digital subscription news service and revenues have been growing rapidly. Um, sample size neglect and representativeness. Actually, you see this a lot with the election. A lot of voters only interact with people of their own party. So you'll talk to some Trump supporter and they'll think that everyone's a Trump supporter, everyone I know. But then you talk to a Biden supporter and they feel the same way. You know, that's a that's due to sample size neglect. They're not talking to enough people and the people they're talking to aren't representative of the population. Uh, some other behavioral bias framing decisions affected by how choices are posed, i.e. gains relative to loss level or losses relative to a higher baseline. You know, if you uh, went up 50 percent on a stock before dropping 10, you know, that would have a different frame than going down 10 before going up 50. Other, other issues are mental accounting. I'm often trying to bring clients to the top line when talking about their portfolio, for example. And then they'll want to talk about each individual account and each individual position, which is fine. But you know what matters is the top line, right? Like how much money they have, what do they make, what do they lose? Behavioral biases also include regret avoidance. People blame themselves for unconventional choices that turn out badly, and they avoid regret by making conventional decisions. So, you know, it, it, regret avoidance stops people from taking risk. Prospect theory, investor utility depends on gains and losses from starting position rather than level of wealth. Kind of goes back to that last topic I just mentioned. Limits to arbitrage. So fundamental risk, market changes or irrationally can eliminate profits. 
A good example today is, you know, uh, marijuana company Canopy Growth, ticker symbol CGC, went up 15% today on the idea that the Democrats well, I mean, the polls have said that for months. Why is it today that it's changing a day before the election? Implementation costs. If you, um, right now, lumber in the U.S. is so expensive um, that they're sending it from China and Russia in order to be sold here. Um, but eventually, you know, those profits will be eroded because the shipping costs are just too high and it won't be efficient for someone in China to send wood to the U.S. And then model risk, right? Let's say what you're using to measure things uh, is inaccurate. If you're going to make, you know, make this a little bit more about politics because of the season, you know, model risk is, is a fa function of why some of the polls got it wrong in 2016. Uh, prospect theory challenges conventional view of the relationship between wealth and utility. Utility is a function of change in wealth, not level of wealth. Uh, the feeling of good or bad that consumers may attach the potential purchase or investors to a stock. So, you know, sometimes you fall in love with your own investments. Um, this is just a conventional utility function. Uh, you have more utility, the more wealth you have function, basically. Um, and this is the utility function under the prospect theory is that we we take when it's a loss, we take significantly less risk. Right. Than, than when it's a game. Law of one price. Uh, so you have two companies that are identical um, and they can trade on two different markets at the same time. This is true with a company like Sony or Alibaba. Um, equity carve outs can violate the law of one price due to inability to short sell. So sometimes one company is spun out of another and there can be inefficiencies in pricing. Sometimes the inefficiencies in pricing and arbitrage opportunities are really related to investors not being able to get insight onto a company when they're aggregated together as they can when they become separated apart. Um, closed end funds. Sometimes closed end funds are an aggregation of stocks and bonds. Um, but the, these closed end funds can often trade at a discount to their aggregate assets. Um, this is sometimes a function because uh, some closed end funds use leverage. And sometimes the fund is out of favor. Their investment style is out of favor. Uh, these funds are not as liquid as other funds. So that could have an impact on price. Uh, pricing of Royal Dutch, Royal Dutch relative to Shell. So... Uh, disparity from parity, meaning, you know, it's break even price and it, and it varied uh, depending on the period of time, even though they were very similar security. Um, some more behavioral critique, uh, bubble, bubbles and behavioral economics. You know, no one talks to you to tell you to buy the stock that went down 50 percent. Everyone calls you to tell you to buy the stock that went up 100 percent. Right. And that's evidence of irrational investor behavior. And the, you know these bubbles are easier to you know recognize once they've passed. A couple of these bubbles, notable ones, include uh, the Bitcoin bubble in 2018, uh, the marijuana bubble in 2016, and then I think the 3D printer bubble in 2014. Um, evaluating the behavioral critique. So there's no coherent theory. Most empiricals support from one time period. Uh, typically from the late 90s. So trends and corrections. So moving average. A lot of investors will look at a stock based on how it's traded against its moving average. The moving average is its average 50-day price or its average 200-day price. People will look at the average price as an anchor. And sometimes this, this thinking actually becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because they'll see that it's below the 50 or the 200-day moving average it's across, it's below its average price across a series of time. So investors will start buying in the belief that it will return to average. Sometimes enough buyers will do that, that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. What changes these technical patterns, though, is the fact that news could come out that disrupts the trend, right? News drops, it changes. Like the charting and the behavioral technical analysis stuff is interesting during a steady period but it's very tough to implement when there's news flow. So this is just looking at the 50 day moving average um, for Adobe. And you can see that when it's above the moving average, typically 
it pulls back, and then when it's below, it rises. Although that's not always the case, they're obviously cherry picking a good example here. And again, this is the moving average against um, against the Dow Jones. Um, so you can see here uh, the moving average. The Dow Jones was above the moving average for quite some time, right? So how long it stays elevated can change that. Uh, technical analysis and behavioral finance. So uh, there's all these different charts investors like to use, uh, traces and significant uh, upward and downward movements and prices without regard to timing. Uh, X denotes the range, uh, O denotes decrease. Sell and buy signals are generated when stocks penetrate previous lows and highs. Um, you know, one stock, you know, just really relevant that has had a hard time uh, breaching its, uh, you know, a ceiling has been, again, canopy growth. Um, and canopy growth, um, you know, breached a $20 level today, right? This is just another chart. Uh, for technical analysis. And again, these are indicators. When you talk about technical analysis, these are indicators. They're not general rules of thumb that work all the time. Um, breath, and that's the extent to which broad market index movements affect individual stock prices. So if you think about the S&P 500, the S&P 500, we would have more confidence in a movement in the S&P 500 if every stock moved up 1%. But you can get the S&P 500 to move 1% by just Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google going up 5% and the rest of the market staying flat at zero. So, you know, the breadth is important of the move. But if the, if the move in the index is concentrated above, among a lot of uh, big players, that's a less confident indicator. There's also relative strength indicators. So recent performance of a stock compared to that of the market, you know, it's a momentum trade because sometimes momentum can work. Some investors have a market diary, timing highs and lows, things of that nature. You know, I, I also have a similar stuff I track for my investments. Um, this is talking about days of declines, days of advantage, uh, advances, uh, and then the breadth of the market, like how many have moved alongside of it. Um, there's also sentiment indicators. That's a range of average volume and declining issues to average volume and advancing issues. So sometimes volume, if a stock is uh, trading higher on low volume, that's a weak indicator. If a stock is trading higher on high volume, that's a strong indicator. Why is that a strong indicator? It usually means like it's likely, likely the function of some news or analysis that's been released that's positive for the company and people are buying in mass. And generally when people are buying in mass, it's because something good is going on with the business. Confidence index, that's a ratio of top rated corporate bond yields to intermediate grade bond yields. So how do the, what do you pay for the best bonds versus middle of the road bonds? Short interest, if you see a stock that has a lot of short interest, that means it's a controversial stock. Some people love it and some people hate it. The good news for some investors is that if you own a stock that has a, a high short interest, uh, for example, one stock I'm looking at right now, I'll tell you, I think it's LGI Holdings. And LGI Holdings is a home builder that reports their earnings tomorrow, November 3rd. Uh, LGI Holdings has a short interest of about 11%. That means, and I can actually show you this chart here, we'll switch screens. Show you this, let's see if you guys can see this here. You can see here, um, the short interest is around 11%. It's declined, but it's still pretty high, right? We can see in 2017, the short interest was as high as 35%. What's happened, that's that's still a high amount of short interest, not outrageously high, but if they have good numbers tomorrow, 
that means this number, this firm can, uh, you know, really put up some potentially great numbers tomorrow. Um, but, you know, we'll see if that happens. Going back to the slides, I, I, I will actually pop on the screen one more second here. Uh, I'll just go over. This is a tool I use called FactSet, uh, and this shows different charting techniques. So, you know, I can also add, uh, let's see here. Uh, So I can add a uh, 50-day moving average to this chart here. And then I can also add, and this is a, I, I love this software, by the way. Uh, I'll also add a 200-day moving average. So if we look at the stock right here, it's below its 50-day, but above the 200-day, right? So I don't know how strong of an indicator that's given us, um, you know, uh, but I, I also looked at the valuation metrics. Peg ratio of 0.9 is pretty attractive. Uh, PE ratio of also 10.5 is fairly cheap. So, you know, this looks like an interesting stock here. Um, and the technical analysis, you know, as an, remember, I use technical analysis last as a spot check. And for me, the technical analysis here based on this isn't telling me a whole lot. It's telling me it might be, you know, I mean, it could be on the verge of a breakout here. Put call ratio is, is similar to the short interest where it tells you where investors are effectively placing bets on that stock, how many people are going short versus long. People perceive patterns that don't exist. Sometimes you can stretch out these charts and, and find patterns that don't mean anything. Data mining generates a patent parents with unlimited sets of data. When evaluating rules, ask whether the rule would be reasonable before looking at the data. So what, what is causing these moves? Is really a good question to ask. Um, we can see stock levels can vary widely uh, across the time period. And this is just a simulated stock price performance. Um, again, just showing the stock market can be volatile. And then again, another chart, really not really too relevant uh, showing more volatility in the markets. And we can skip that too. That's the end of this chapter. Um, I can show you some other stocks uh, on FactSet uh, for a couple minutes that I just find really interesting ways I'll look at information and da data charts. You know, one, one other stock that I think I find interesting here um, would be uh, Yelp. While Yelp is loading, we know Yelp is associated with the restaurant business. Restaurants have been hurting, but the stock price for Yelp has also been devastating. When you look at like the bullishness, the Yelp is trading at below its 50 and 200 day moving average. It's already it already was punished, you know, all the way back in March um, for really the pandemic poor performance never really recovered. Even a few months ago during the last earnings period, uh, they reported bad news continued to drop. But, you know, in the last three months, restaurants have reopened. We'll see what happens. Yelp is another company that has a high amount of short interest for for obvious reasons. Right. They're exposed to restaurants during the pandemic. So, you know, we'll see. They also come out with earnings in the next week or so. See if there's one or two more names I can show you guys with charts here uh, that might be interesting for you. Um, here's another name, Match.com. Match.com, I always found that name to be really interesting. Um, exposure to online dating. Online dating has become more normalized. Um, chart's really small here because they changed the ticker symbol recently. So it's actually a stupid chart. We shouldn't look at it. I'll try to find one more for you. Um, Cuervo. They make uh, 5G chips for the iPhone and they do military communications uh, technology and software. Um, let me see if this loads up. So this is a stock, you know, I'm invested in. I'm going to be watching this week. They also report earnings. Some point the stock will load. Here's Cuervo. 
right? Very low short interest, reasonable price to earnings ratio and a reasonable peg ratio. So there's not a lot of technical indications coming out of this chart. It's kind of settled and consolidated over the last six months. We'll see how earnings go. Uh, we'll try to find one more that has like an interesting pattern. One that I'm kind of fading interest on is Sprouts Farmers Market. Sprouts Farmers Market, it, this is almost right. If an investor, you want to know what this is, you know, this right here is like a classic almost head and shoulders uh, pattern, which is really negative for the stock. This head and shoulders pattern would indicate that um, the next level of resistance is around $15 a share. So, you know, the stock could easily drop another 20% from here, according to the chart. Now, whether that happens or not, you know, depends on the information that comes out, right? Could it could it rebound here and rally? Certainly, you know, it depends on what's going on, though. So um, I'll show you guys one more. Let's just, we'll have some fun here looking at charts. Besides, this is a quick chapter. So, whoops. I'm going to pop in Sony here. Again, Sony trading above its 50 and 200 day moving average has a reasonable market level uh, price to earnings ratio, uh, very low short and uh, kind of expensive peg ratio. So not too much being told here. But what what is what we are seeing here in the end of 2020, uh, like today, what we'd say is it's broken out. Sony has broken out against its 50 day moving average. So that could indicate that it's in for kind of maybe a meteoric rise. So guys on this note I'll end uh, I'll end chapter 9 looking forward to your thoughts and comments and speaking with you soon